Hello. Uh, welcome everyone to another Hangout session of HBCU to Startup, uh, where we meet with entrepreneurs, tech startups, and today we're meeting with a nonprofit. Um, and we do this to give you an inside scoop of what's going on in tech and talk about news and opportunities. So today we're meeting with Everett, who is the CTO of Base Impact. And at Base Impact, they're using technology basically to solve real world, real world problems. Um, I'm also joined with Tariq Hook, who is the Director of Education at Zip Code Coding Academy in Wilmington, Delaware. And Tariq, I'll let you e introduce yourself before we go to our guests. Um, sure. Um, Tariq Hook, uh, Philadelphia native, working out of uh, Wilmington, Delaware, um, teaching people how to use software, um, also involved with uh, Open Data Delaware. Um, that's pretty much it. All right, and now we're going to go to Ever. Ever, are you still with us? Yeah, I hope so. Okay, your camera, I don't know, my, the camera seems a little frozen from this perspective. That's uh, okay, I'm not as good looking as you guys. So. <laughs> All right, Ever, so I gave a very brief, brief introduction. Um, if you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, Base Impact, and this new program, The Bridge. Yeah, of course. Um, so my name is Everett Wetchler. I'm a CTO at Bayes Impact. Uh, we're a nonprofit tech startup. Um, and so my background's in computer science. I studied computer science and electrical engineering in school. I went to Duke on the East Coast. And I came out here to California almost nine years ago uh, to work for Google, where I was a software engineer for about five years. Um, and I have almost all good things to say about Google, but uh, at least a little bit of my personal story, just because it, it does play into, you know, how I do my work here. So, you know, after three or four years, I kind of hit a wall of motivation. I think, you know, there's a lot of interesting scientific problems to be solved at Google, and it certainly pays well, but I think that I wasn't really excited about solving abstract problems for their own sake. At the time, I was at the ads quality team. So, like, if you search for shoes or something on Google, you might get ads uh, on top and on the right, and there's a relatively elaborate auction that runs behind the scenes to try to decide what are the right ads to show you right now. Um, there's an interesting problem, but I realized that if I did my job well, uh, Google makes more money from ads, and the world is somehow different because Google has this money instead of whoever had it before. Um, and since, I don't know, I just became increasingly aware that uh, as a uh, young, uh, young person in tech, I was not going to have trouble making enough money to, to be okay and like, to eat to meet basic needs. And so as long as I have, like, modest material ambitions, you know, of all the things in the world that I could be doing with my time and my next 40 years of work, uh, is this really it? Is this really the most I can do for the world? Uh, and the answer was, like, definitely not. Um, so that sort of started a longer quest that eventually led me to Bayes. Um, I worked at Google.org for a year. They had, they had a couple of research projects that they were doing uh, to try and increase Internet adoption, um, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so I did, I spent a bunch of time on the ground in West Africa, um, in Ghana. Um, we did some experiments with mobile phones. Mobile phone penetration is really high, but people still don't use the internet. We were trying to understand what was going on there. Um, but ultimately I moved on from Google, and that's like a longer story, but I was really looking for a group of techies uh, and who, either data scientists or software engineers, who just felt this like burning thing that there's, the Silicon Valley has more to offer to the world. Uh, than what they're currently doing. And after a lot of conversations and a lot of hunting around, eventually stumbled across uh, Paul and Eric, my co-founders of Bayes, and they had sort of latched onto this idea of using data um, to, as, a, as a lever to cause a lot of social good in the world. And so I signed on, and we, we started this about uh, in summer of 2014. We went through Y Combinator uh, right after that. Um, and we've been kind of figuring out our model since then. But like the simplest way to put it is that, um, and this is like the most honest way to put it, is we're really like trying, we're kind of like an incubator for ideas of how tech can change things. It's not just, uh, usually things that have a strong data component and a strong engineering component. Um, and so we are always exploring kind of all social causes and looking for leads and looking for partners. And then we try out some potential ideas, like, oh, what could we do in this space? How would we validate if this is a good idea? Who would we work with? Where would the money come from? Who in the private industry is already solving this problem? Um, and after doing this, we gradually winnow down to a few that are getting more traction than others. And so at the moment, we have three projects that we're working on. 
which is honestly like one too many. We're gonna whittle it down to two pretty soon. But we um, have one project in France uh, working on unemployment. We just opened a Paris office about a month ago. Uh, my co-founder Paul is French, and unemployment is one of the biggest issues in France. I and mean, despite being a first world country, unemployment's around 10 percent, and that's about double the U.S. Um, and it's been high for a while. And every politician runs on the platform of I'm going to fix unemployment, but it never seems to go away. Um, and so in brief, what we're doing is we're building sort of a web platform to uh, help people find their next job. And it's going to use a lot of different data sources, um, some of them not previously released. We can look at things like economic trends and skill sets. So we could say, oh, you've been a baker for five years, but actually there's a lot of carpenter jobs up and coming, and a lot of people can make the transition from baker to carpenter, and so this is really what you need to be focusing on. And this is the kind of advice that theoretically people should be getting from uh, the unemployment center. Like France is a socialist country and it's very centralized and so when you become unemployed you register for unemployment benefits and then you go and your counselor is supposed to meet with you kind of like a guidance counselor and they're supposed to give you tips and sort of help you figure out how to get to the next place. But in practice they're humans uh, so there's a lot of uh, big data out there that they're not leveraging, they're kind of just using their own memory and intuition. Um, but also they're overworked. Like if you want to meet with a counselor you might have to wait a few months. Um, and so it's just literally just not serving the people. So at least at first blush, there needs to be like an electronic portal where people can go and get help. Um, and it's gotten a lot of traction with the French government, um, and so that's why we op opened an office there um, to sort of build this out. And it's still relatively young. We haven't released a product yet. But that's sort of an example of one place where we found a, you know, and obviously the people who are highly educated and high, highly skilled jobs aren't really going to need this tool, but this is meant to really help everyone all the way to the bottom. Uh, all the blue collar workers, all the people, a lot of young people who have limited experience, don't really know where to go, all of them. Um, so this is a, hopefully a way to reach people at scale and to solve a problem that's pressing for the, the French people. Similarly in the US, um, we've been, you know, looked at a lot of things, but Probably the most pressing, one of the most pressing issues at least is criminal justice, or criminal justice reform. There's just a lot of problems with uh, the criminal justice system. Uh, many of you probably know a lot about this, but it's, it's all over the place. I mean, in, in the U.S., we put more people in jail, both per capita and absolutely, than any other country in the world. Put people, many, too many people in jail for too long. Uh, it's half of the prison population is uh, black, a quarter is Hispanic. Um, so it's not even, it's not even close. Uh, to, to an equitable um, uh, system. And also, you know, in recent years, obviously, like, police violence has been on the rise in the, in the news. It's hard, actually, we can't, I can't even say that police violence itself has been on the rise, but certainly attention to police violence has been on the rise in police use of force. And part of the problem is exactly this, that we, there is no data on whether or not, uh, on who exactly is using force, how and when. There's no reliable data. There, I mean, there is some but it's notoriously difficult to get police agencies to report information, and there's generally just a dark of this. So we are kind of going into this space. Um, originally, uh, we're, we're kind of laying some infrastructure so that a lot of this data can be made available, and so we can actually have a conversation around what's actually going on in our police forces. We can't improve something that you can't measure. If we don't know how, you know, how things are going, then all we do is crowd around a YouTube video and both sides yell at each other and that's not a way to set policy, that's not a way to change anything. Um, so like roughly that's that's the domain that we're, that we're looking at. That's very interesting. Um, so what kind of what kind of data sets are you guys looking for people to submit to kind of help facilitate this? Right, so there's, good, there's an increase in um, reporting mandates uh, that are coming down. So there was this, there's this uh, death in custody reporting that's been around for a long time that came from the FBI, where if anyone you know, dies while in the process of arrest or while arrested, there has, there's a certain form that they have to fill out and send on to the FBI and to the state. And it sounds like sort of an obvious and reasonable idea, but they failed to collect this from everyone in a consistent way. I'm not sure what the percentages are, but well under half um, of incidents are actually reported. Um, some, but, you know, there's also uh, an increasing number of requirements that are being passed afresh. In California, at least, we didn't have any um, other reporting beyond this death in custody and a few annual aggregates. Um, and in the fall of last year, 
the assembly passed uh, this bill, AB 71, um, called use of force reporting, and it requires that any time there's an exchange, interaction between an officer and a civilian where one or the other gets seriously hurt, they have to report that to the state. And they have to report information like the races and ages of all the people involved, the type of force used, where on the body was used, what kind of injury uh, it, um, the person incurred, whether they were hospitalized, whether they were suspected to be um, under drugs or alcohol. Um, I can look through the entire temple, but these are sort of the kinds of fields. It's not, they're not collecting names, um, but these are meant to be used to, to show aggregate statistics and so you can investigate um, individual incidents. I don't know if that answers your question. It, it starts to answer the question, but like one of the things that, um, number one, it sounds amazing, right? But one of the problems is that, um, and I, I've read this on your website, is that there's no, there's no unified way for police departments or re, um, response departments to uh, record this data, right? So right. beyond the technology, I mean, if you're not looking for uh, things from community organizations to to start putting out there, then there has to be some kind of policy put in place um, to help facilitate the things that you guys are trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So in this case, the a lot of the problem with passing um, policy that requires more data collection is that if you don't provide a good means for collecting it, you will not get the data that you asked for. You'll get it in bad formats. And this is what happened with death and custody. People so will submit it in physical paper, they'll send it in PDF, they'll send it in Excel, some will send it electronically. Um, for this particular bill in California, we worked with the Attorney General's office and it's being required that they submit electronically through a web app that we're creating um, that will enforce a specific data standard. And so it'll be mandatory for all departments to report in the exact same way in a timely fashion. Okay. And so, uh, this uh, we have a, a team member who couldn't be here today, but he had a question concerning the reporting of the data. Uh, in the past, there has been some distrust already from the community uh, and the police in terms of the police not recording or right. uh, or reporting the accurate information. Is there any way that this tool or software um, that we're talking about now could could correct or identify? Um, errors in reporting? So, I mean, the, the problem of um, underreporting, or really you want some kind of double entry accounting, really. You want to be collecting incidents from, you know, not the police and from the police. Um, it's very difficult. Um, so it will be hard to know if a police department is underreporting without auditing them. But we can do things like measuring systematic underreporting. Like if you take, if we aggregate the reports from the entire state and you randomly audit a subsample of them and see if they're over or underreporting, um, then you can generalize to get a sense of, okay, how much of the real issue are we getting at? So if they audit a few of them and they're underreporting by half, then we know that our overall numbers are probably half of what they should be. Um, you can also check, look for statistical outliers. Like if you have a lot of information on the counties, you know their population, you know the number of sworn officers. And so you can look at the clip of uses of force for other counties that are similarly sized. Um, and if you can, you can use that to you know, potentially suggest which police departments need auditing more than others. Like if two cities have a million people and 2,000 officers and one of them has five times the number of uses of force as another, then it actually could be that the one using more force is a problem or the other one's underreporting. So you can use math to kind of flag areas of interest. And if things look relatively constant over a lot of um, police departments of similar size, then at least you have evidence that there, um, there is some consistency, consistency there. Uh, the ground truth is really hard to come by. So there's, in the, I read the article that's also on your website about uh, this software helping to rebuild uh, the divide or trust between officers and citizens. What are some of the things that you're hoping to accomplish? What features will there be to basically rebuild this community and rebuild trust between law enforcement and citizens? Um, so I can give you my sort of grander vision that this is uh, a part of, but also I'll say that like as a not, not a member of, uh, you know, a community of color or just a generally, like uh, a community that's traditionally um, oppressed by the police, I can't necessarily say, I don't know what will make people feel safer exactly. Um, but I do think that 
what my, my vision for the future is that a lot of what police and all government agencies do will be externally visible by default. So for the Ursus one, like they, or sorry, uh, for this particular use of force one, um, it's, we're calling the initiative Ursus, which is what the DOJ came up with for the name. And they thought it was very clever um, because it's a bear and that's California. Anyway, um, but so for, for this particular initiative, it, like because it, it's a required part of their end of year reporting, this is good, but really all of police software is terrible. They all um, buy third party vendor software that um, comes off the shelf, they pay a lot of money, it gets installed, it's never quite what, what they want, and all of their data stays closed. Um, so we're kind of hoping our, we're not sure on the timing of this, we're gonna probably wait until after this particular tool launches and see how the data collects. But if we could give police departments a set of free, like web-based tools instead of native Windows programs uh, that did their current job better, but also by default shared a lot more about what was going on, um, then not only is a lot of more information available, it could be all data around calls, traffic stops, everything. Um, but also this kind of inverts how governments work, like this idea of you build software that stays within the house um, versus like everything I do is housed elsewhere and most of it is automatically shared with the citizens that I'm supposed to be representing. Um, so that's kind of a long game thing, but this is step one. What about like, okay, so as a person of color, right, um, I, you know, I, I just have this inherent distrust of the police, right? Yeah. Um, I grew up with that. Um, whether it's, you know, always justified or not, God knows, right? So, I mean, it sounds all, I mean, and but I'm also a computer scientist, and data is like my best friend, right? So I love the idea of there being quantifiable data that's mandatory for them to report, right? But what, for, for listen, me listening to it, it's like you're asking, I mean, and, and, you know, this is completely not fair, and I'm actually playing devil's advocate, right? That's and fine. Not my personal belief, but, like, it's like asking your bully to keep track um, yeah. <laughs> and be proud that they beat you up and how hard they hit you, right? Yeah. I still, as an individual that may have been involved in this, I don't have this hilarious that we got at. That's pretty funny. I, I know. I'm trying to mute my. Uh... See, we, we, it's, it's getting too real. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, I mean, honestly, no, seriously, like, um, that does, I mean, as a African American male, that doesn't make me feel safe um, because I still don't feel like I have a voice. So when somebody is telling me that they're doing something to create, um, well, number one, to track certain things and also to, what's the name, to, to make me feel safe or just make sure that people are treating justly, I want to make sure that somewhere in there I have a voice. And, you know, and, and, and that's why you open up the data up. So, like, to be able to, I see an event happen, right? The police report it, right? To be able to go in and give my opinion of it. Or, like, what's the name? <laughs> I saw that. And, again, it's taken as my opinion. But, like, is there any type of plans to kind of incorporate, like, community feedback on, on the events that went down? So we haven't talked about ways to have the community be able to look into, like, a police incident and match it up. Um, we do want to have like a more public like citizen complaints dashboard, and I know the citizen complaints are kind of a joke, but um, you can ideally, if the software that everyone was using was the same, um, then they wouldn't really have a way to hide things. Like if you enter a citizen complaint, for example, and you say, okay, I was on this street on this corner at this time, and I saw something go down, um, then you know it'll it'll be part of like a, a database that people can have access to and say, okay, look, there's all these complaints that aren't getting. Um, addressed. And ideally, if you su submit something that says you saw something sketchy go down and, you know, the police agency ignores you, every other citizen would be able to go in and see that you filed that. Um, see, it's beyond that, right? So it's not that I want to have a soundboard, right? That's not what I'm, I'm talking about. I'm yeah. talking about, I'm on a corner, here's a prime example. Um, I'm out, I live in Wilmington. Wilmington has a very high crime, uh, crime rate. Yeah. Um, I see it has something go down. I see the police respond to it, right? Um, there was absolutely nothing that the police did that was out of pocket um, at this particular event. I'm just using this as an example, right? Sure. But let's say that something did happen, right? I don't want a sounding board to go to just like so it goes to the pot. I want to be able to look up after that event happened. I want to be able to look up that event and then 
directly attach my account of what happened to that event. Okay. And know that whatever I had to say about what that happened is now part of the public record, and anybody looking that up ever again will see my opinion. I see. Okay. All right. Well, let's think about how that might work. Because um, I mean, I think that's you know, that's a that's a great um, solution. Because then it feels like you can't. It doesn't just slip through your fingers. I guess there's two situations there. One is like I, I think in a typical conducting of police business, if they're arresting someone, there'll be an arrest report. Um, right. If there was a use of force and they're doing their job right, they'll also file a use of force incident. Um, generally, all police departments do use of force differently at the moment. Some of them track very light things to very heavy things. Most of it's done uh, to avoid liability. Uh, but yeah, so if you were to, let's say you were to go online, I don't know, like later that day, like you don't see anything. Or maybe you go a couple days later and you don't see anything. It doesn't say anything happened. What do you want? What I want, I mean, see, the, the, but that to me is telling, right? I want to be able to report that, right? Okay. So if I don't see anything, right? Like, because again, like this tool, if the, the way that I'm hearing everything about the tool, number one, I'm not taking anything away from what you guys are doing. I think it's amazing, and I think that it's needed, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about as a person that is affected by this type of behavior, like how do I how do I respond to it, right? Yeah. I'm not I'm not, affi I'm not affiliated with the police in any way, shape, or form, but I, I just kind of want to be able to do something, right? Mm -hmm. And I see something happen, and and number one, there is no report, right? So okay, number one, the ability to get that immediate feedback, okay, I know that they're not reporting, right? Mm -hmm. Now now the ability for me to address that, right? And I know that you have to take that with a grain of salt because. Um, you know, everybody that's going to be reporting stuff is not credible, right? Um, I get that, right? So, I mean, that, it ha that data has to be treated differently, but I should still have some type of venue where if it's true transparency, where I could say, no, 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 no. Something happened here, and I I'm asking for information about it. And if I'm not get given information or you get enough people asking the exact same question, you know, then that cues off something for somebody to look into it. Okay, so what can you help me just ex say a little bit more about where what in that specifically makes you feel safe versus not? Because that's the that's the that's the key. About, all right, so the thing is, it's not about like <laughs> when I, I mean I look at when if I'm getting arrested, right? I look at it like I look at software development, right? It's inversion of control, right? The first time, as soon as the lights go off, right? I'm looking, my hands go up, and my argument is done because I know that I have absolutely no power in that particular situation. My only responsibility as an African-American male is to navigate through this as safely as possible. So it's like, I keep my voice down, I don't start arguments, and I don't, what's the name, I'm not doing anything to incite them to respond to me, right? Mm -hmm. Even though that right there is not keeping me safe. I'm just playing probability right there, right? Because that's not, what's the name, this is not the time for me to be able to respond to them. And I think that's where a lot of people make yeah. that mistake, right? The yeah. time for me to respond to it is after everything is said and done, after I've been processed, after there's been some paperwork, after all that stuff, now it's my time to say, okay, you know, I was treated unfair, right? Okay. What may, and, and again, it doesn't make me feel safe, but it makes me feel like I have some type of recourse, mm -hmm. right? Or okay. if I'm not the person that gets arrested, I see somebody, I see something happen to somebody, right? as part of the community or people in the community can go there and hold the police responsible for doing their job. If you didn't report it, I want to say that you didn't report it, right? Mm -hmm. I want somebody to respond to it. If you did report it and you say that, okay, this was not a use of force, right? That's BS. I saw you hit the guy, right? Mm -hmm. Now, again, you got to take that with a grain of salt because mm -hmm. people will go out there and say, people yeah, will yeah. say things, right? People will yeah, say, yeah. So you got to take it with a grain of salt. But at the same time, it's all. But I want that to be always attached to that report, right? Mm -hmm. And that always be that 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 thing that's there that makes somebody look at it a little bit harder and be a little bit more critical about it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Everything you're saying makes perfect sense. sense. Um, um, hang on, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I'll just talk to you. Okay, good. It fixed itself. Um, yeah, so in order to do this properly, in order to actually pair with real police incidents, I mean, because you could make like a web app or something that just collected community thoughts. 
on and just they go into a void and like no one looks at it and you have no idea if the police actually did take that incident seriously inside and they were reporting it through the chain and whatever or if they ignored it. Um, so you actually need a, the, the entire operations of the police to be available to the same uh, to also to you. Like the same central agency has to be able to talk to you and to talk to the police and to know everything that's going on. Um, it's very difficult to get police to buy into more transparency. Uh, for obvious reasons, like, I mean, for bad reasons and for good ones, like, I mean, the, the, the good cops that are in there are trying not to get skewered by, they're not trying not to be burned at the stake um, when they're trying to do their job. Um, and so there ends up being this, like, herd resistance uh, to changing things. And so, you know, honestly, policy from the top is one of the few things that does, but I would love to sort of invert the software paradigm so that they don't, by default, think of their police agency as like a fortress within which all the operations happen and all the information stays. In order to get the information outside of the fortress, uh, we have to do something more creative. And I hear you, and I don't have an answer, and I don't have a solution. And that, that's fair. And like again, I'm not attacking you or that. I'm just hey, I know. I like look. This is. I mean, this is your what you're doing right now is like half the point of me having this conversation. So I appreciate it. Okay. Um, before I hog up all the questions, you got another one? No, I think I just wanted to, to add on to that as well in terms of adding. I don't know if there's any plan to correlate some of the data that you're collecting from the police with other, uh, other points of data. Um, other points of data, such as? Uh, I mean, one example was user input um, from user input that Tariq talked, talked about maybe a user adding additional information. Another one could be correlation of, I don't know, uh, maybe there's a, there's a few cameras that are available uh, through like traffic cameras. I don't know, uh, just kind of like if there were any thoughts or plans to correlate um, reports with other possible sources of uh, data. Uh, plans, no. Um, no. The, yeah, so yeah, it's one thing at a time. The, the cameras is an interesting one. Um, they probably guard closely, and I mean, you know, I'm gonna like after this call, I'm gonna think more about how we would be able to reasonably get um, two-way reporting. Because it's like I said, it's not gonna work if there's just an arbitrary portal where you send in your report of what happened, but you don't have any, you don't know if an actual incident went down. It's just I don't know at the end of the at the end of the year if the DOJ gets like a pile of citizen submitted. You know, reports or complaints, and uh, you know, another pile of supposed police uh, uses of force, and tries to match them up uh, later. That's not very satisfying, you know. Like you, you see something happen in March, and you write something in, and you hear nothing, and then at the end of the year, you look at their jointly published data, and you try and see if something was is in there. So, yeah. So I'm not sure. Um, like, you know, this is uh, a good. What we're doing is kind of just like the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's a start, um, and I realize it's not the finish line. Um, and that's part of why I want to get more conversations going with community groups and potentially like hire people from communities of color um, because the only way, because the last thing I want to do is uh, do something like this, claim that we did something that mattered and helped heal kin community relations but actually didn't do anything. Um, I just, like being a hypocrite sounds like worse than just working for you know a hedge fund or something. <laughs> so at least then I'd be rich, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, tell them how you really feel. <laughs> yeah. I mean, speaking of which, how, how are you guys funded? Um, mostly foundation grants. We've been, it's, funding's an ongoing struggle. Um, at least in France, we're going to get a large grant from the government itself. Um, for, in the U.S., we've been paid zero dollars to work on policing stuff so far. Uh, we got a large grant to do some healthcare research, and that's like a third project that I haven't talked about just for the sake of brevity. Um, we have a grant from a healthcare foundation to do some research on hospital readmissions. Um, we're actually looking for our, a funder to. We're doing this this thing we're doing with the California Department of Justice. We're doing for free, um, and we're trying. And that's you know based on money from these other sources. So we're actually trying to scope uh, what a grant would look like and what we would do with it. Um, but I think at least in the immediate term, we're gonna launch this uh, use of force collection product um, and wait a little bit and then go from there. But yeah, we're going to have to approach like a foundation. We've been talking to the, you know, I, I think a lot of the money will come from like police and criminal justice based foundations. There's, there's the police foundation, but also on the other side, there's like the Arnold Foundation, which cares a lot about criminal justice reform. Um, so those are our best sources. 
Uh, we've tried the individual donations things with mixed results. It's just a lot of time and effort um, to collect enough information, or sorry, to, to collect the relationships and to, to get enough money together. Um, and so far, and like no rich dude has wanted to like drop two million dollars on our work. So <laughs> and, yeah, so I mean, it's a hustle. Um, I never expected to have to hustle for money so hard. I didn't want to think about money, but that's how it is. Yeah, I have, a, I have a question. Uh, so for, for this case, we're talking about use of force, and that's use of force, how law enforcement defines it. Do you know specifically how they define yep. uh, use of force? So this is defined by California Assembly Bill 71. Um, there is, I can read it out, but basically in this case, um, it's any incident where um, an officer is caused, or a civilian has caused serious bodily injury, and they have a definition for that. It's like unconsciousness, uh, serious disfigure, disfigurement, hospitalization, or death. Um, I, I'll have to look up the exact, you can Google this if you want, it's public. Um, and also the same for force on officers. Um, so it, in theory, it captures when officers are getting hurt by people, though that's more rare, um, obviously. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is, uh, and this goes back to Tariq's point in terms of being from a community, um, specifically a black community, where I would say definitely you see you see more harassment um, mm -hmm. and the use of force is, I mean there's some use of force but it's definitely on the, say, the, the rare side whereas harassment yeah. is on the higher side and it's, there, it's really hard to get the abuse of authority and to get any accountability in that aspect. Um, and I could just say from a personal, personal story of, you know, growing up, I remember actually a, a police officer pulling a gun on my father. And that's something that someone doesn't, you know, forget. But I'm sure there's no record anywhere uh, <laughs> of this guy, you know, pulling out his gun um, on my father because he ran through a rolling, I uh, call it a rolling stop where you don't stop all the way at a, a red stop, which is probably, and especially a man and his three kids, uh, I was 10 at the time, so my younger sisters were younger than me, one being six and the other one one years old. Um, and that's not, I'm pretty sure that's not recorded anywhere, uh, but yet this is something that kind of like stayed within my memory. Um, so I, w I would just say, I, I know it's hard to kind of cover all bases um, and you're working with what you have right now. Uh, but from the com from the community side, we definitely see a lot more of harassment, uh, which may mm -hmm. not be defined as use of force um, by the police uh, terms. Yeah, and honestly, like you're not going to get the police to self-report harassment with any yeah. credibility. So that's even more of a, a fool's errand. Um, use of force, at least they, you know, they're not going to ignore when someone gets injured. Like the the paperwork is kind of inevitable. Um, for that one. And you're right. So like in a situation like that, I'm trying to think of, I mean, you could have, part of the problem with, you know, citizen complaint dashboards is just like, a, you know, a web form where it gets sent to the police department for them to ignore at their own will. Um, but if you had some other entity that was collecting all the complaints and could ensure that they wouldn't get thrown away, then at least there'd be a record somewhere of like, hey, I was pulled over for this reason and someone pulled a gun on me and it's sent in um, and everyone can go look at that. Um, later, and I don't, I don't know what else you can do in that situation. I mean, I'm asking, kind of. I don't know what you would do. I mean, I'm uh, thinking a little bit more um, about some other topics. One of the things when you were describing use of force was saying that normally it involves um, unconsciousness or uh, a trip to the hospital, or pretty much it always involves some type of hospital stay. Am I correct in that as an assumption? Um, not necessarily. I mean, this is for serious use of force. This is not like all use of force. Um, like if he just like you know kind of wrestles with someone to arrest them, then like that doesn't really count. It's like where they someone gets hurt. Um, but in the cases where you do have, um, when you do have to involve the hospitals, and I know you have. Uh, uh, I mean, I know there's information about uh, uh, patient uh, confidentiality and all that stuff, right? where hospitals can't report certain things. Um, mm. I don't even know if that really applies, but is there any type of way to kind of tie in that data to kind of validate what's going on? 
So to sort of pull hospital data to validate the injuries. So if the cop Not said the industry, industry in, injuries, it's just like okay. So here's a here is the hospital is required by law to record and report events that happen. What so I mean I know that they are required like gunshot or whatever. But when the police bring them in, there's a record there at the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. that independent independent of what the police have to record, right? And is there any type of way, and I know I'm asking a lot right now because now you're talking about uh, private medical institutions where you can marry those two. Hmm. Okay, so to somehow match the police report of what happened with the medical report of what they observed? Right, I was saying, but not, not just match it. Like, I don't want the police to take that data and walk it over, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want like what's the what's the create a tool for the or and, and it would have to come with some kind of legislation as well, where the hospital is re required to report it, and then all that stuff matches up. So now you can really start taking a look at it. Where mm -hmm. they may not be as inclined to report things a little bit more lightly. Yeah. Um, again, let me, actually, let me take that back because I don't want to accuse any. Uh, what's the police department of doing that? I mean, if they're guilty of it, then they're guilty of it. But I don't want that to be the assumption, or at least come off as my assumption, as every single police department does that. But it'd be interesting to see that. Right. Yeah, I guess it's... I mean, there are disparate sources of data. I mean, it all comes down to we need to get... We want not just trans... We want truth. We want to know what actually happened. Some, like, in theory, impartial party, like a concerned citizen or a judge, should be able to get some kind of perspective on what really happened. And in the normal law system, if you're on trial or someone's on trial, there's a for and there's an against, and there's like, you know, there's there's two sides that are making cases. And here there's only, you know, one side is much more able to make a case than the other. And so I think, you know, integrating hospital data, um, I, I mean, I'm not like promising to do anything with it, but like the sentiment makes sense. That's another potential lens through which to view the incident. Um, you've got like the person who's involved, who's you know probably going to be upset and angry and you know biased in their own way. The cop who's going to be biased in his own way, and then the medical practitioner who hasn't seen a lot of it, but they saw the results. So, I mean, that's a good thought. So on, on another tip, like I know you guys are, you're, I mean, as a nonprofit, you guys are always taking money, but like you guys have only a certain amount of bandwidth. Um, are yeah. you guys allowing people to volunteer their time for coding? So. I have very mixed feelings about I'm volunteering. I so first of all, I love that people want to volunteer, and you know, semi regularly there's a trickle of people reaching out to us saying like, you know, I love what you're doing, but you know, can I volunteer or work part time? But like the the time it takes to you know, if we were going to hire someone, we spend a lot of time investing in you know recruiting and vetting people. Um, so there'd have to be some kind of vetting process for volunteers. So There's like a big overhead. Um, and also, I'm working with um, volunteers in a couple other capacities, and it's debatable if it's worth the effort. Like, if I had someone who I knew, like, from personal references or could somehow validate that they were, like, very good and they could drop in on, like, a Rails project or whatever and do some stuff and I wouldn't have to check behind them. And, or, I mean, you know, they, they would write good tests and, like, all these kinds of things. But you know, I find that if I'm working with someone and they're not taking it as seriously, which it's hard to, you know, as much as you want to be into it, it's hard to take something as seriously when it's not your full-time job. Right. At some level, like, you just don't feel as accountable for the product of your work. And I know this is the impersonal you, and I don't mean to blanket call things on everyone, but this has been my observation. So I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm still, I'm not close to the idea. I guess I'm just uh, hesitant based on um, experience. Okay. And so you, we started kind of like touching, the, touching down the the point of what are, what are the uh, technologies that you that you're using, um, languages, stack. What's what are you guys using? Sure. Well, for the police project, it's just a Rails app. Um, there's not a lot of the the stack. It's on Amazon. Uh, we use uh, Docker for everything. Um, we like we actually we wanted to use uh, Mongo uh, like a, just a, a document database because there's not really a reason to have a relational structure. It's easier to change if we want to change the schema. Um, um, we're actually using Amazon's DynamoDB, which is basically Amazon's hosted document database. It's like Mongo but worse. <laughs> uh, it's not as good, but Amazon hosted and DOJ wanted to not have to maintain 
a database on their own. So we're like, okay. Um, so we've hustled with that. For the French project, that's uh, heavier on JavaScript. So they're using, I think React is the main workhorse um, of that. And actually, the, the web server itself is Flask. But that's also running on Docker on AWS. Um, and for our data analysis stuff, like the healthcare project we're working on is mostly analysis at this point. We use a lot of Python. We use uh, IPython notebooks, libraries like Pandas and NumPy and SciPy to do a lot of um, you know stats and modeling and things like that. Just ports of general stuff you would use in R or something. But I think Python is definitely overtaking R um, you know, for uh, among data uh, for data analysis in general. Not for everyone, but yeah. How many people are in your team so right now? We have five in the U.S. and five in Paris. Okay. And of those, um, most people are everyone's technical uh, for the most part. So in, on both sides, uh, we have three full-time technical. Uh, though my co-founder Paul, who's not, not, I'm not counting among those who's in in Paris, like was a data scientist before um, we founded Vase. Um, so yeah, three out of five, or six out of ten. And I know like. Later down the line, um, you're looking to bring people on for specifically the bridge project. Mm -hmm. uh, what are what are the things that you're looking for? Um, man, that's a tough question to answer. I mean, there they have to be like a talented, um, you know, full stack or really front end developer. They have to be good with um, most like general web frameworks and be very familiar with building web apps. That's on the technical side, but um, you know, I, there's also just a set of like personal traits that we look for in the people that we hire here, because um, it's. I think we have built a really unique place to work, um, with a really rare set of people, and I'm not really willing to compromise on that, no matter how good somebody is. So, I mean, traits like people who are able to be candid and compassionate at the same time. It's hard to do both. There's some people you can be kind of a pushover, but be a great listener, or you can be, you know, very forthcoming but kind of a dick. Um, so we, there's some like uh, line in there. Um, we have a lot of meta conversations about how our individual relationships with one another are going. Um, we try to balance being, um, you know, productive with like not burning out. Um, so it's definitely like uh, we have like high investment personal relations relationships with one another, and it's not just for it's partly like to to connect on a very human level, but. Um, it's also partially just so that we can be more effective at our work. And we're in this for the long haul. We need to lay roots now um, and cultivate people for the long term. So basically, no assholes need to apply. Uh, um, no assholes and no pushovers. <laughs> no assholes and no pushovers. Yeah. Uh, Tariq, did you uh, had any, have any further... Well, I mean, I, I, know, I know you wanted to also talk about um, Baze's involvement in Y Combinator. And, uh, oh, yeah. To go through and accelerate as a nonprofit. Yeah, I didn't get to that one. Good catch. Yeah, so the I actually didn't participate in any of the Y Combinator stuff. I joined Bayes. Like Eric and Paul had been brewing up this idea, and they'd gotten into YC, and I joined and was actually like doing data science while they were going through YC. So I can't share much with that. I know what nonprofits are new to YC, and they didn't necessarily, we got some contacts out of it, but I think they're still figuring out how to incubate nonprofits. It's certainly not as strong of a program as their for-profit side. Because um, we have different monetization schemes, like the money is different, um, products are different, the reason for doing products is different, um, competition is, exists, but is different. So I don't know, it's debatable how much we got out of it. You know, being a nonprofit, I think that one of the, um, the hardest things is uh, raising funding. Is there any type of plan for any type of self-sustainability for you guys? Yeah, so that is exactly, so we've played with a lot of different thoughts, but I think for this police stuff, if we were able to uh, sell our software either to individual police departments or to the state, we could have some kind of maintenance contract for, I mean all the stuff we're doing is going to be open source, but if they can pay us to like keep it running, um, then that's a totally viable way to do it. Like if we build new infrastructure that government uses and they pay us to keep it the way it is, then that seems great. Um, uh, I don't know what the long-term plan in France is uh, for the unemployment stuff, but for the hospital readmission stuff that we're doing in healthcare, there's you know getting money for for health is a lot easier. Uh, you can get paid by community clinics, you can get paid by hospitals themselves for what we deliver. We can you know we're, what we're building you know 
is a tool that is open source and theoretically they could use, but you can also have a model where you kind of, kind of like the MongoDB model where people pay you to, to install it and to run it for them. So like, okay, like in theory, we could build the capacity in-house to just take your code off the shelf and run it, but we'd rather just pay you to do it because it's your thing. Um, so that's a potential sustainability model there. But like the super honest answer is we haven't figured it out yet. All we have is ideas. So we're going to have to be held over by grants in the time, for the time being. Okay. Yeah, and then we are coming close to the end of our time. Can you let, let us know what is the best way for uh, us and people who are watching or people who will watch this on YouTube to support uh, Bain's Impact uh, and The Bridge? Um, the best way to support us? Um, have a conversation with me. Just like shoot me an email if you have thoughts. I just I like to collect different perspectives from people. I'm just Everett at BayesImpact.org. Um, so any reactions you have, um, as far as being supportive, you can. I mean, if you follow us on Twitter or Facebook, if we you know post something that we're doing um, and you think it's good, uh, then you can you know retweet it or whatever. Um, I'm not like super bullish on social media in general, but I'd rather collect interesting people who want to talk to me about um, about their thoughts on these things. So that would be the, my preferred medium. Oh. Cool. It's a... Sorry. So a tweet coming. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not good with this multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, uh, Tariq, did you have any final thoughts? Final thoughts. Um, number one, I, I just want to praise you for the work that you guys are attempting to do right now. Um, I think it's... Uh, well placed and well needed, um, and um, I just want to applaud you for that. Thank you very much. It means a lot. You know, I do have one final thought or one final question, and we talked about this a little bit before. But you know, right now we mentioned that your your team doesn't have really any underrepresented minorities currently on the team. For those who are seeking to join the team and are black or Latino. What are some of the things that Base Impact can do or will do to ensure that that person can be successful in that role? Sure. Uh, I will say that at least in SF, we have five people um, from four different countries. And even in Paris, there, I guess they're mostly French. So we are internationally and culturally pretty diverse. And so there is, it's not like everyone is exactly from the same background. So there's definitely a lot of sharing, like Stefan, my German coworker, and Mehdi, my Iranian one. Um, you know, they're always uh, great people to bounce thoughts off of. So, you know, I, I know that's a little bit different than being, you know, an explicit minority, especially like my skin color. Um, so I can't, I can't promise that I know exactly what to do. Um, all I can promise is to listen um, and to talk about. I, mean, I will definitely drag it out of you if you're, uh, if I can tell that something's off, um, to figure out, okay, what's bothering you? Like, how can we figure this out? How can we get you support? How can we introduce you to other people who are also in communities of color and in tech and talk about your experience with being, you know, the only black, the only Latino person on the team and how that affects you. Uh, I also want to create a space where if you feel like you're being talked over or kind of ignored a little bit um, because of your race or your gender, um, that that would be something you could bring up with me. And the thing I do love about my coworkers is that we're able to own the thing, most of the time we're able to own the things that we do, even if they're not great, I'll be like, wow, yeah, I was actually just kind of a dick there. I'm not real proud of that. Um, so that's all I can promise you. I think that's real cool. Hopefully. Yeah. All right, well, um, before we go, uh, Everett, is there anything that you would like to say? Any final thoughts? Any, um, you have an event coming up, right? Oh, we do. We are hosting a hackathon this weekend. It's pretty full, but it's uh, bringing representatives from the federal government from a lot of different major departments, transportation, commerce, health and human services, veterans affairs, uh, to have some prompts that are a mix of data and engineering. Um, I think it'll be, it'll be fun. Um, I, what I'm really hoping for out of it is to use people's creativity to come up with leads, because a lot of what we do at BASE is try and figure out where is a place that technology could help a lot of people? And hopefully by attacking some of these prompts, we'll uncover some leaves that nobody had thought of yet. Um, so I'm hoping we'll, we'll get some new ideas there. Um, but meanwhile, you can totally follow it online. Like you can check out, if you go to our website, it'll link to it. You can see the prompts. You can play with them for yourself if you want. Uh, you can send feedback, things like that. So it'll be a cool event. 
Um, but other than that, I mean, just thanks for the time. It was, it was really great to talk to you. No, thank thank you for taking the time, uh, and thank you, Tariq, for taking the time as well. I know it's a bit later over there on the East Coast, so thank yeah, you. Thanks for your straight up questions. I appreciate it. Hey, yeah. man, I'm here for the people. All right. <laughs> All right. So for those who are watching, please tweet us and let us know what you thought about the hang up hangout. Also, we want to know um, what do you want to see in future hangouts. So send us a tweet. Let us know what's going on. Um, other than that, we will see you soon. So everyone have a good night. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take Bye. care.